Americans for Prosperity is committed to breaking barriers across the country, and Americans for Prosperity is growing across North Dakota. By calling on lawmakers to reduce taxes, spend less, improve health care, and provide second chances, we can empower all North Dakotans to rise. We're fighting for you. Join us today so we can make North Dakota the best state to live, work, and raise a family. Americans for Prosperity paid for this ad. Senator Kevin Kramer joins me now. And uh, Kevin, as you come on, I, I want to talk to you, of course, about the scandal, the situation impacting one of the most important institutions in our country that everybody's talking about, everybody's paying attention to. And of course, by that, I mean the Houston Astros sign stealing scandal. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to, of course, get your get your input on that. Do you think that's a bigger scandal, though, than Derek Jeter? Um not getting one of the votes for the Hall of Fame. I mean, that speaking of baseball, it's in a, so, it's in a tailspin. You, I mean, you're 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 poking at a at a sensitive spot. I mean, I, I <laughs> my love of baseball started with Derek Jeter. I mean, I was I was 16 years old when I really. I mean, I always kind of liked baseball, but like 16 is when I sure. really started paying attention in earnest. Had the attention span to sit down and watch a baseball game. Uh, it's it, Derek Jeter. I mean, that was the year 1996. Derek Jeter and the Yankees won their first World Series of that sort of era, and so. Yeah, I mean, do do I want to do I want to say some nasty things about the one guy who didn't put Derek Jeter on his? <laughs> how does Derek Jeter not belong in the Hall of Fame? Like, how do you make that case uh, to me? I don't know. Well, it's almost it's almost unanimous. He belongs yeah. there. <laughs> well, and I agree with you. So, with, but yeah, but but the base ceiling thing is quite interesting because obviously it's got it's it's end up with some pretty wide ranging ramifications considering you know former houston astros coaches have ended up being managers and it's it's quite widespread but what i what i sort of find interesting about the whole thing rob is um is this the like the you know doesn't this happen a lot uh, like every day <laughs> evidently not but i guess the, n- nothing quite as elaborate as this but here's the other thing about well, well, that well that's interested. kind of the thing i mean see, stealing signs i mean the other teams don't like it but it's always right. been I mean, they talk about it. I mean, it's it's right out in the right. open. And it's it's if, right. if you're if your bench coach can see that that uh you know the pitcher's doing a certain thing when he's gonna throw a change up, or if your guy on second base can decode what the catcher's doing to in and can somehow mm-hmm. signal to the batter, I don't know that that it, that it was as effective. I mean, because cause first of all, you know, being able to, to do it that fast and then communicate, I mean, how fast the pitcher's throw and being able to communicate it to the batter right. that quickly, I just don't know how effective that ever was. What the Astros did is this wasn't players on the field or even coaches, right. people who were participating in the game, which everybody, I, I think I think just about everybody thinks that's all, I mean, the pitchers may not like it and, and you might get a right. you might get a fastball in your ear for, for, for doing it, but I mean, that was all just part of the game, right? If, if, if you're mm-hmm. loose with your signs and the other team steals them because they just see what you're doing, that's fine. When you got a staffer out in center field with a camera and, and then you got another staffer sitting at a monitor and you're banging a trash can, that, to, that was cheating. It was full-on cheating. Yeah, cheating. It was not okay. Uh, not it, okay at all. No. Well beyond. No, I, okay. I agree with you, but anyway, um, uh, and baseball is such a wonderful game, and it's a really an intellectual yeah. sport in many respects. And uh, it's you know chess with a bat and ball. It's it's just wonderful. Game. I did so I did not bring you on to I talk think about. It's great. I, I did not bring I you on to talk about baseball. Kelly Armstrong and I keep joking that we're going to start a baseball podcast <laughs> because he's a. You he's guys a, should do that. He's That'd a he's awesome. a nut like I am. Um, yes, he is. <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk impeachment. I, it was it was. Sure. I actually listened to everything that that Adam Schiff had to say on the, on the Senate floor. Um, I might be the only person in the country who did because it was long and it was a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. He said something that, that just, when I heard it, I, I just, it just so, sort of, cause everything, I mean, it kind of becomes like, like at some point it just becomes chatter in the background and it just cut through mm-hmm. sort of the, the fog of having sat and listened to it for so long. This was remarkable to me. Um, he said, I quote, the president's misconduct cannot be decided at the ballot box for we cannot mm-hmm. be assured that the vote will be fairly won. Mm-hmm. That is a remarkable it, thing for, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it, it's, that's not an off the cuff thing that, that that's some bomb that somebody's throwing on a, on a talk radio interview or something like that. That is a, 
somebody who's, who's really, I mean, when, when we're talking about the Trump impeachment, I mean, Adam Schiff's going to be uh, much like, you know, Ken Starr was with, with, with Bill Clinton. I mean, it's going to be a name for a long sure. time. And for, to stand at the middle and say, um, you know, to be that dismissive of the will of the people was remarkable to me. What it is, is it really is a complete confession of their motives in this whole process. And, and that was the most eloquent version of it. Um, it's been repeated in various forms and ways since Adam said that so, so perfectly. Um, but what's astounding to me is you're right. It's not an off the cuff statement. In fact, to them, it's, it's their main, it's the main point of their case, which tells you how little regard they have for our republic and for the exceptionalism of our system, <laughs> including, by the way, the, the, the incredible power that the chief executive has in our system. And maybe, and we can argue it, by the way, I, I think there are a lot of good, honest people who have disagreements about the policies and whatnot. But to that point, um, it, it really does highlight the flaw in the, the really the flaw in the premise of, of the whole impeachment the whole impeachment deal. But it also then raises the question of how far are you willing to go to prevent the people from having their say? It's interesting, Rob, one of the things uh, that, that has been talked about a bit among the Republican members uh, of the Senate, uh, and, and we talk about the, those that are on the bubble, you know, the swing votes on and witnesses and all that kind of becomes the sexy topic of the day. But several members who went in, you know, Thinking maybe we'd hear something new, maybe we'd hear something more compelling than we heard watching the, you know, the reruns of, of the House impeachment process. When it really occurred to people that they are not just re aiming to remove a president, but to remove a president's name from the ballot in the next election, that's been a bit of an eerie realization to some people that, that they hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about before. Can he run? I mean, if he gets impeached and removed for office, can he can he still be on the ballot as the candidate? He he, he cannot. He cannot. So that's he the law. Cannot. That's the law. And so so that's really that's the impeachment law. And so the, the, to your point, not only do you rob people of the opportunity to vote for him, but you're also robbing people of the opportunity to vote against him. And, you know, some nine, 10 months, depending on when we're done with this thing, um, before they have that opportunity. So, um, I, you know, I, I do think I even get the sense a little bit that there are some among the managers or maybe Adam Schiff, one of them, that actually think they're going to convince some senators and, and get their conviction. Well, that, that's clearly not going to happen. And they've already now had 13 hours of debate on amendments and, and over 16 hours of debate on their actual case. Not when it's not even debate, it's just their argument that the, uh, the defense hasn't even had their time yet among you know, their 24 hours. And so the, uh, the managers are over 16 hours through their case and they've only come up with about an hour's worth of information. They've just repeated it so many times and there's some value in repetition. Uh, we all know that as communicators, there's some value in repetition, but there's also an exhaustion in repetition and they've gone well past the exhaustion part of it. Um, and so you, you start thinking, yeah, you know, they actually believe some of this stuff, or at least they believe that the outcome is possible. But on the other hand, it is also obvious, Rob, with their repetition, that's basically a video loop that they play several times a day, um, is really designed as much as anything for, you know, the MSNBC audience as it is, uh, for, you know, certainly for a hundred senators. I have always felt that elected leaders have, and I don't, I don't say this like like I'm giving anybody a pass because I, obviously in the, in the position sure. that I'm in, I, I don't I don't give elected leaders many passes. Uh, Republican, Democrat, no, you I don't, do not. I don't care. <laughs> you do not. You're very um, consistent. They, but 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 you when take it, but, your job seriously. But when it comes to to removing them from office, saying you're not allowed to vote mm -hmm. for this person anymore, to me that that is a very 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 high threshold. Like I need, I I need the guy to have like murdered somebody, right? I mean, I need the mm -hmm. or 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 just flat out like on camera. Here comes here comes uh, you know France or something with a with a big basket of money to give the president. You know, I mean, I, I need something mm -hmm. just huge. It, it can't be. We don't like the, his demeanor and the way he does things, or we right. don't like the way he went around this. I will tell you, I do not like the way the president of the United States handled the Ukrainian situation. I don't like that he involved Rudy yep. Giuliani at all. I think that he had yep. official channels available to him that he could have exploited. Uh, and he didn't, and I wish he had, and I disagree with him on that. And 
you know, for, for me and, and for millions of other Americans, that could impact our votes, right? As it should, because that's our job, right? When we go to the ballot box, we're evaluating yep. his job performance. You don't like his job performance. Maybe you don't vote for him. Um, to me, I don't, I have not yet seen anything that rises to the level of saying this guy should be removed from the office. How President Trump handled Ukraine may well cost him the election in 2020. I don't know. Mm-hmm. We'll find out in November, maybe. I guess if he's still, if, if I, obviously the Senate yeah. is probably not going to vote to remove him from office, but. Yeah, so assuming he's on the ballot, he's probably, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens there. But I just don't see it. And I, I think it's dangerous to to start this sort of apparatus rolling where we're going to start saying that, that, that we could potentially remove somebody from office, not because there's just some, as the Constitution says, high crime or misdemeanor, but because we just kind of didn't like the way they went around about their business. Because I feel like that's what we're doing at this point. Well, I think I think that you're exactly accurate it's a little bit like sentencing a petty thief to a death sentence um and, and people fundamentally know there's an injustice in that but it's even further exacerbated exacerbated by the fact that it's the people's vote that's actually being taken away and so the, so the one thing in our society in our system of our exceptionalism including by the way the fact that even our military is headed up by civilians is is that the, the power belongs to the to the people and that's being robbed of them in this instance particularly when it's this close to the election and and remembering that you know there's a lot of talk about precedent and this has never happened before this way and this thing has never happened well it's not like we've done this a lot <laughs> you know this is only the third impeachment of a president in, in our history there have been other impeachments but it's hard to draw a lot of you know direct analogies to to other impeachments than the president but I think you're exactly right, and that's. But but this is what you can count on a lot of times, especially in my view with liberals. Although I've seen plenty of conservatives do the same thing, and that is overplay their hand. Uh, you know, as as the saying goes, you know, killing the man, committing suicide. You, you just. This is why our, our our system is so exceptional because the power does belong to people. And and by the way, lazy democracy. I've, I've often referred to lazy democracy. Lazy democracy is 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 not a reason to to do. You know, to take democracy out or take the take the um, you know the ballot away from the voter, um, we need to inspire the voters to be you know more diligent about their both their right and their responsibility. Do you feel like like there's because the whole point of this process, you know, and, and I've, I've, I'm I'm tired of everybody comparing it to a, a judicial process or, or something like yeah. like out of the criminal justice because it yeah. is it is not. Um, it's anybody not. who's familiar, it's, it's, I mean, the, 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 you know, the United States Senate is never and never since its inception has it been an objective body. It's a political body and any proceeding that takes place within this chambers is going to be inherently political. And I say that not pejoratively politics right. is the means through which we govern. It's imperfect and it's That's ugly, right. but it's sure better than the alternative. So here we are, yeah. uh, but but it is supposed to be a re- revealing process, right? I mean, it's mm-hmm. that's why that's what mm-hmm. the House goes through their thing, and you have witnesses, and and there's evidence and everything mm-hmm. else, and then it comes over to the Senate, and the Senate con- considers those witnesses and that evidence. Has anything been revealed to you in this process? Like like anything new that that, that surprised you? N- no, it really hasn't, Rob. And I paid, and I paid a lot of attention. And one thing I would say about that, and to your point about the Senate not being a jury. I, I'm very. I, I, I hate to use the word proud, because particularly about myself. But I have to say the institution and the, and the 100 senators, at least my 99 colleagues, have been very diligent in this. You know, the fact that they've sat through that we've all sat through, with very little exception. Um, you know, the occasional two and a half hour, you know, time for a break, uh, and then the occasional getting them going to the restroom and, and coming back or going to the cloakroom to get a snack and come back while you're watching it, by the way, on TV screens and in all those places. Uh, it's pretty amazing how responsible I think. And I, I shouldn't be amazed by it, but I just want people to know that Democrats, Republicans, all 100 have been very attentive and uh, and I think quite curious. And I'm not surprised by that necessarily, but I think a lot of people might be. Um, but you're right. There's not one of us who would be chosen as a juror in this case if it wasn't the United States Senate and it wasn't impeachment. And I think people have to keep that in mind that, you know, in a jury selection, you get thrown out if you know the defendant or if you know the accuser 
or if you know the victim, or if you have, you know, right. if you've expressed. And this instance, opinion. the so, defendant recruited you to run for the United States Senate. So that, <laughs> that precisely. So um, you know, clearly, it's not. It's not that. But but that doesn't mean that. You notice in the in the uh, in the uh, swearing in, you know, the oath, if you will, you 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 promise or you pledge to impartial justice, and uh, and impartial justice, I think, can be can be provided by partial but you know, partisan people uh if if you're honest about it and you leave your mind open so i really haven't i i, I haven't to back to your question i really haven't seen a new revelation of any type um to, to be honest with you i would say maybe this maybe the one thing i would say that, uh, that that this has caused me to think more about and that is that the the definition of high crime and misdemeanor um the fact that it is vague um, that I'm, I, you know, I, I think I have some, I think I have some openness. So I know I have some openness to the idea that it doesn't have to be a technical crime. It doesn't have to be a, a, a misdemeanor. It doesn't have, that the corruption by the, by a president, um, is not necessarily confined to something that's written in the code. However, I also agree. I do agree with you that the, the standard, the bar is very, very for yeah. from I mean, listen, if it's and, if it's a technical violation or something, I'd rather that be resolved at the ballot box. Uh, yes. You know, if it's if it's I, I'm just for, for and for elected officials, I don't know. I don't care if we're talking about uh, the, the, the weed control board in Ward County where mm-hmm. I live or the president mm-hmm. of the United States. If they're accused of doing something wrong, man, I need it to be bad. I need like the president inviting the Canadians to invade. Right. Like just smoking yeah. gun <laughs> on video. Uh, it's a right. silly idea, I know, but you, you know what I mean. Like I need it. I, I need yeah. it to be that, not. Well, and and again, I, I say this to somebody. I don't. Do you like the way President Trump handled the thing with Ukraine? I don't. I don't. I don't think you should be well, removed from office over it. Let, but let I don't think he handled it well. I I don't from from this standpoint, if for no other reason that that the, the power of the purse. We get back to these separation of powers issues. That power of the purse and the Congress and the United States. We, we voted for all that. Now I would say this. That, that it's not nearly as egregious as, of course, the managers are made out to be, because there there was a change in Ukraine that provided an opportunity, and we've seen other changes in other countries that have where where aid has been held up for weeks or months, sure. um, the geopolitical things, and in this case, it was a, an election of of a new president, a very, the unlikely to win, but who ended up winning in a landslide, and and in, in a very corrupt country where. You know, there's a rationale for the pause, for sure, and and so, but to your point, no, I'm not, I'm not crazy for it. But here's the other thing, and, and, and you brought up the Giuliani thing, and I, I think that's something that's been uncomfortable for a lot of people that, that the President Trump went outside of the normal official circles, if you will. Um, but when you watch the videotapes of the witnesses that the, the managers have put up. And, and remember, they're just showing us the stuff that they think is best. I get, I get very uneasy by the lack of, um, well, let's just say the, the, what I consider to be the arrogance of the bureaucracy over the elected official. Again, a lot of this, you can't trust a lot of these people. And I think they've demonstrated that you can't trust them if you're Donald Trump because they don't like the, his his positions. They don't like his policies. They didn't think he was going to win. They've been out to get him since the beginning. I don't think that anybody can even doubt that in, in, anymore, given all the evidence that, that um, the bureaucracy has been against him. And when you, you get to a point where you can't trust the people around you, and, and especially people that are assigned to you from another agency, you hear a lot of talk, by the way, about um, – you know, career officials. You'll hear the managers refer to career officials a lot. They also refer to the interagency group. It's like, well, nobody elects an interagency group. Nobody elects, um, you know, career officials. And 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 the, the the chain of command gets flipped on its head. And so Donald Trump is thinking, and I'm I, I'm not speaking for him, but I'm thinking I can see why he would hire a crime fighter like Rudy Giuliani, his own attorney, and you know, give him some access. Um, because you don't trust any of these other people. But even that, all of that said, Rob, one thing you've always been consistent about, and I've always appreciated, is is this issue of let things be settled at the ballot box. And um, and you applied that even to the courts when you've oftentimes have said, you know, the courts are, should not be the remedy 
for bad policy, um, the ballot box should be the remedy for bad policy. And uh, and so you've been consistent on that. And I, and I, I I'm I'm with you. I think there's a I'm not crazy about the way you handle it, but there's an election coming up and somebody else can it can weigh that in the context of everything else, because on balance, by far, Donald Trump's been a very successful president and good for North Dakota. And and, and I just want to go the Rudy Giuliani thing. I, I wish he had worked through official channels like like even even if he mm-hmm. had to appoint Rudy Giuliani to some position within his administration sure. so that he's not his personal lawyer out there doing it. I wish he had done it that way. Instead of the way he did it, I don't really have a problem with the president withholding the funds. Uh, whether you, I, and I realize that's that's kind of a debate. It's a separation of powers issue. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think in another era we called it the impoundment of funds. Uh, a, lo- right. a lot of presidents, a lot of presidents in the past, Thomas Jefferson impounded funds. Uh, in fact, I think sure. Thomas Jefferson wrote about how the executive branch had that authority. Thomas Jefferson, who was not. Well, at least, at least until he was president, was not a big fan of executive power. When he was president, things right. changed a little bit. But, uh, I mean, everybody did it. And then there was like the – I think it was the 1974 Budget Control Act. And that was during the Nixon era. And you had a very liberal Congress. And you had a lot of people who were upset about Richard Nixon. And then Congress came in and sort of took – but essentially, impoundment is, is, is the executive branch saying, Congress, you, you appropriated the money. But we as the executive branch don't necessarily have to release it from the Treasury. Because the treasury is under the executive branch. And there's a whole constitutional debate about that. And it's one of those never-ending yeah. sort of frictions between those two branches of government, which frankly I think is one of the genius the genius of, of the American system of government. We should have that friction. I agree. So I don't, I I don't, I don't, I don't you, have a problem yeah. with any of that. I have a problem with it being Rudy Giuliani. It just it just looks a little hinky. And I'm sorry, perception mm-hmm. is reality in politics. You didn't need to create that perception. That's always been – on this particular situation, the sticking point for me, why Rudy Giuliani? Yeah. And I think, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't want to make excuses for, it. I mean, Rudy Giuliani is obviously a friend, New Yorker, fellow New Yorker, um, sort of a bare knuckled uh, politician himself. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's easy for me to understand their connection and their, their relationship. Um, uh, but that doesn't necessarily, you know, relieve you of your angst about it. I, I, I completely I completely get it, and I, and I think it's a relevant point, and, and certainly the um, you know the house managers have made a big issue of it. Uh, but I, again, I, I look at it all in, in balance and on, in context, and uh, it's a long ways from uh, removing the president from office. Let's talk about something that's not impeachment. I'm reading a headline in the mm-hmm. L.A. Times: California will be hit hard as Trump administration weakens clean water protections. I feel like North sure. Dakota has a different view of that because this is kind of the the waters of the u.s thing right i mean this is this is really this is really undoing something that i think what one of the reasons i i think it's often overlooked people talk all the time about why rural america has turned so hard against democrats i i I think i think this issue i think a lot of people have overlooked it just how important it is in in that dynamic Mm -hmm. oh i don't think there's any question just to put in some context imagine uh, first of all, I think it's important to remember that the waters of the U.S., there have been two previous waters of the U.S. rules that have been remanded back by the um, Supreme Court. And that's and, and it centers around this definition of navigable waters, and, and it's a called, really called navigable waters protection rule that defines the, the waters of the United States. And the broad definition of, of liberals of the waters of the United States is such that in North Dakota, literally 90%. Of the of the state's landmass would fall under the federal purview with with the uh, you know the previous rule the 2015 uh, Obama rule. So when you think of 90 percent of North Dakota's land and mass, now you know how much of our land and how productive it is it would fall under that purview. And and that doesn't mean that you know that there'll be a taking of all 90 percent at least not on day one, but it does further erode private property rights and local control. Two things that we you know in the middle of the country care a great deal about and and that's why this broad definition of, of uh, navigable water that's why the supreme court twice has remanded it back and this rule so t- t- just just to give a couple of definitions th- this rule the new rule um and and by the way i was asked earlier by a reporter was there anything that you don't like i'll be honest i don't like the idea that there has to be a rule i mean the, the, the idea that the federal government now defines what they what's under their jurisdiction and what's not um, it is sort of offensive to me in the first place, but at least this is a better definition. But under under this final rule, 
um, there's there are just four clear categories of, of federally regulated waters as opposed to like a dozen under the previous one. Um, but so the territorial seas and, and then what's called traditional navigable waters. So that includes, you know, you and I know what navigable is. You can put a boat on it, right? So right. like the Missouri River, the Mississippi River that, that, that moves commerce. Again, that's where federal jurisdiction comes in into the Commerce Clause. And then uh, then there's, there's the, like the perennial and, and, and other tributaries that go into those waters. And then some, you know, the other impoundments, lakes, ponds, uh, wetlands that are adjacent. And see, to me, that's even a little bit of a yeah. stretch, but see, and that, and that, it's that, far better. That, 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 that dis- the distinctions you're making, I mean, that's, that's why I read the L.A. Times, because it, it kind of struck me where it says California will be hit hard. Mm-hmm. And my response to that is, hey, California, if you feel like there's a gap in the regulations here, you got a legislature. You got a governor. Right. You have a massive mm-hmm. state bureaucracy. If you want to regulate this stuff, then regulate it. It's your state. Now, yeah. and there's some, yeah. I mean, obviously, if we're talking about rivers that cross or bodies of water that cross state lines, then there's, right. it, it's, it, California maybe can't act unilaterally there, but for the most part, within the state of California, California can do what California wants. So, you know, I mean, why, right. why do we need these? I, I, I always think it's interesting where you have states asking, you know, federal government, please come in and regulate it. And of course, the feds are always, the Commerce Clause being a perfect example, are always looking for excuses to step in and manipulate state level policy. I don't think we need that. I, I don't. Right. I don't think we. Need, I, I would prefer that states. North Dakota should take care of North Dakota. There's some. Our, obviously, we're not. We're not on an island here. We got. You know, we have neighbors. We belong to a union of states, mm-hmm. and and our policies need to reflect mm-hmm. that to a degree. But we don't mm-hmm. really need the federal government to come in and protect North Dakota's waters. North Dakotans can do that for sure. Not they, for sure. And when you consider things like you know an ephemeral stream, for example, an ephemeral. There's there's a difference between intermittent and ephemeral. Ephemeral is one that's only has water if after a, a major rain event and then it goes away. Uh, you know, an intermittent stream has water sort of seasonally. There's a big difference between those two things. And and, and same with a farm drain, you know, or or you know, uh, drain tiles, things that that we put in to actually enhance our productivity and the health of our land and and whatnot. Th- these things are under under the old waters rule would be under federal jurisdiction, and under the new one would not be. And and I think that's a much better definition th- in terms of what you're talking about. And that is the rights of states and their elected officials and their their voters uh, through those elected officials to manage their own water that's, that aren't true interstate yeah. water. Well, I just, I, it's just some of these reporters they get their skirts up over their heads and just like, oh, yeah. the waters are going to be ter- <laughs> well. The nothing says the states can't step in and still do something about it if there really is a gap or there really is no a problem. The, you know, no it's question. for for crying out loud. Let's calm down. Uh, let's see. I want to hit another thing. March for life today. As a matter of fact, yep. I was just watching, uh, I'm watching cable news, uh, in the background here and I'm seeing a president Trump set to address the March to life for, for life today, which I, is he the first president in history to do that in person? He is the first one in history. Um, it was either last year or the year before he did Maybe. it by, he did it by I, I video. Forget. I think he, he did was like the a first video one to message. address them. At, you know, he had a group of them come to the Rose garden. This is the first time he's actually addressing the entire group. It's the first president in history to do that. How important is that? It's a really big deal. It, you know, what's interesting. I was visiting with my staff about it a little bit this morning. In fact, the significance of it, I think, is it's not just because of the history of it. I also think it's a reflection of, of how the, the pro-life movement, the, you know, the abortion movement, maybe we can say, we went from, you know, Roe v. Wade. To, and then the, the, the call for abortion should be legal but rare, and it should be safe, and to, to now where there's an entire industry, to, to the point where Planned Parenthood you know, opted out of Title X when, when President Trump changed the rules for re- regarding abortion and their ability to take Title X funding through, through the Medicaid program. Um, they opted out of it and gave up $60 million of federal dollars a year, but then just announced last week that they're going to spend $45 million dollars on um on the elections to push for pro pro abortion candidates you know that's over a hundred million dollars flipped and and that's how big the industry the abortion industry has become but in that process where many times what once were old-fashioned extreme ideas become you know crazy and crazier and crazier and then you mainstream you know that the corruption if you will 
in this society, the opposites happened, where, where actually the old-fashioned idea is becoming more the mainstream idea. And a lot of that has to do with, I think, centers around the science, the science and the, and the medicine and the, and the advancements in healthcare and whatnot that have demonstrated that, no, you know what, life is life. And it begins a lot sooner than, um, you know, than the law previously I, allowed. And so, I, I, th- I, th- I think it's But really... I also say the activism is a big part yeah. of it, Rob. And that's what we celebrate today. Once a year, it's the, by far the biggest annual event in Washington, D.C. and gets almost no coverage from mainstream media. I think the... I, I think you I think you hit on a really interesting dynamic. I was looking at some polling, and American attitudes have shifted on a lot of things. Um, yeah. Legalizing marijuana, for instance. I mean, like, like right. a, a lot, yeah. a lot yeah. of these sort of social issues, I guess I'll call them. Uh, gay marriage sure. is something that, that a right. lot of Americans have shifted on, a public opinion. Yep. If, if, you look at, if you look at the pro-life issue, it, it really hasn't. It really hasn't shifted that much. It's certainly not as much as, as some of these other areas. And I think part of that has to do with what you're talking about. I, I think as it becomes easier to prevent unwanted pregnancy, I think the case for having an abortion becomes less clear. Um, because yeah, it, it's, it's, if, if it's easier to, to prevent an unwanted pregnancy, and, and obviously you can't prevent them in all instances. I'm not saying that by any stretch of the imagination, sure. but sure. we have better. And, and this is something I, I don't know if you've been following, I've been writing about it. Roxanne Salonen and I, a, a fellow columnist at Forum Communications, in fact, the previous podcast is with her, got into a little bit of a back and forth about this. Um, I, I'm supportive of a, a program at NDSU where they're sending out condoms to students. I think great. Let's if we can mm-hmm. have they're having sex. If you look at if you look at surveys, uh, even back in the 1950s, most Americans were having premarital sex. So, I, I mean, if, if we're going to have sex, have condoms and prevent unwanted pregnancies and diseases and everything else. Also, uh, and use birth control and have better access to birth control. I think that's probably one of the most powerful tools we have to lowering the number of abortions is let's prevent unwanted pregnancies. Do you feel the same way? Well, sure. Although I, I do think that we also have to lift up the nobility of of um, chastity and, and you know, not having sex before marriage and all those things. And, and, but that's really the, that is the the job of the culture. It's the job of the faith community. Um, but at, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I think you're you're right. Let's start by um, preventing unwanted pregnancy, and then. Um, should there become, you know, should we have unwanted pregnancy? Let's let's lift up the dignity both of the, you know, of the the parents and the child, and and use the other tools that we have, uh, and that is a whole bunch of people that would love to adopt children if they were available. Sure. And we just we just I think to your point and to your you know to your credit, having this open discussion, uh, both where where people agree and disagree, is an important part of. Um, you know, important part of improving it for everybody. Uh, last question. We're in a new year now, mm-hmm. 2020. It's an election year, although not for you. Uh, you you, uh, <laughs> right. you have a couple of cycles off now, uh, which, by the way, you always told me that you liked when you were in the House. You said you liked campaigning mm-hmm. every cycle. And now you're not as I a did. senator. You mm-hmm. miss out? You're going to miss right. the campaign? I, I do miss it a little bit, um, Rob. I do. In fact, I've been I've become very active um, as, as a senator in 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 my own um participation in other people's campaigns. I mean, I've been, I've been encouraging candidates. I was a very early encourager and then supporter, for example, uh, of Jason Lewis over in Minnesota getting into the Senate race. I've been encouraging a number of House candidates, by the way. I've, I've been able to um, both help host some fundraisers, attend fundraisers on behalf of, of House friends. Um, and the state party in Minnesota, I've been very active with them, the speaking at events that there's down town have been invited to keynote their, their state convention um so i've t- you know i'm trying to use the platform i have now and the, and the time uh, between elections to remain active in fact um yeah. very active with with the national Republican senate campaign committee because we have we have to protect the, the senate majority in an election year like this uh, first of all to support donald trump should he be reelected, and and probably as important if not more important to be a backstop should he not be reelected. Uh, your goals for 2020? Yeah, so yeah, the, the impeachment thing has created a bit of a defensive goal, if you will, on the one hand. On the other hand, what I want to see, just, just as an example, my first year, I, I, I've i had a very successful first year with regard to defense, and National Defense Authorization Act on the appropriation side, big things that we were able to get accomplished to the point where when it came time to review in preparation for, for this year's National Defense Authorization Act, what we want to see done that was left off of our list we got everything done on our list last time so going forward what i want to do is my my biggest my biggest overriding 
um, issue, Rob, every day is is to break down the bureaucracy even further. As I sit here and as I see it and as I fight it, um, I see more and more of a deterioration of the elected branches of government and the greater power going to the to the executive branch and particularly the bureaucracy. We've made some progress on that. We're certainly, Wires of the U.S. is a big part of that. Um, so my goal is to continue to expose as many of the opportunities as we can to restore authority power back to states and and to the uh, to the elected branch of, of government. And that covers the gamut of issues too. It's it's not just in it's not just in waters of the US or environmental policy. Um, it, it's it's with lots of in lots of areas. So um, yeah, that's 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 pretty much my focus going forward. It has a, a lot of it has to do with agriculture in particular energy to a, to a great degree as well but um, when I see the taking the regulatory taking of people's individual rights um, over their their own their own communities and their own land and uh, their own resources um, I, I find that about as egregious as government can get well, I'll uh, I'll let you go. I know you got a long day of listening to uh, yep. more impeachment stuff ahead of you, and uh, <laughs> and and then the, the the president's side. I guess the defense begins what tomorrow? Is that right? Tomorrow. That's yeah. That's right. All right. So it'll they'll head into the weekend. I'll let you get to it, Kevin. Thanks for your time. All right. Thanks, Rob. Always a pleasure.